So we're gonna talk about some important dates to keep in mind, the process, and then uh, we'll get into my favorite part of the FY21 offerings, go over some federal requirements. So most of these are those statutory requirements that we all have to keep in mind when we're purchasing our vehicles or selecting them in CAM, that customer acquisition module that you all access through drive through And then just some tips and tricks to make sure that this year goes as smooth as possible. And then finally, I'll open it up for questions. Um, as Stacy did mention, you know, we will be um, able to share this um, presentation. So why replace your vehicles? Um, you know, GSA has more stringent requirements, so we do replace your vehicles um, even quicker than the FMR does require us to. And so the reason is that we want to ensure that you are all in a modern, efficient, and safe fleet. And every single year, our automakers produce more and more efficient vehicles. Um, why do they do this? Um, partially because they are required to. The CAFE standards require that they increase the efficiency of the vehicles each year. And you can actually see that because they're able to get us more and more efficient vehicles, the vehicles that we do bring into the GSA fleet, they are um, more efficient. And so in FY20, the new vehicles that we replaced, so your outgoing vehicles that were aging, um, they were 19.6% more efficient than the vehicles they replaced. So that's pretty impressive. Um, that really does mean that we're making our fleet as efficient as possible. And so when automakers are looking to make their fleets more efficient, they do this in a number of ways. And some of the ways they do this is through producing vehicles that are made of lighter materials. They also put more aerodynamic tires on their vehicles. And sometimes they make these you know, turbocharged, more efficient engines as well. And so they continue to look for more and more um, ways to make sure that their vehicles are more efficient. Um, IHS market does predict that automakers will continue to do this. Um, and they'll also do this through reducing power, creating more electric vehicles, improving those rolling resistance tires, and improving some aerodynamics. So um, really great way. And so the great thing for you all is that there's less vehicle downtime um, when you're replacing your vehicles. And so we're able to offer you some programs such as our law enforcement program where we upfit the vehicles for you so you don't have two vehicles sitting. You know, you're not waiting to get a vehicle upfit. Um, and then we're also able to offer you more advanced vehicle technology if you're replacing your vehicles um, more frequently. So we're really happy to do this. So just wanna to touch on the acquisition timeline. Before I do so, keep in mind that GSA Fleet, we do offer year-round ordering, whether you're coming in and purchasing a vehicle from us or you're leasing. And so generally speaking, the new contracts, they usually are awarded sometime in, this, in September or October, and we're able to open auto choice for you. Um, so you're able to order and we're able to open CAM to you so you can start selecting your vehicles usually in the fall. Um, and this includes all of our offerings from light vehicles to law enforcement, light duty vocational trucks, um, vans, wheelchair, bus, ambulance, and then medium and heavy trucks as well. So we're able to offer all these for you. So currently um, all of our new fiscal year 21 contracts are awarded, but we are waiting on the medium and heavy duty trucks. And so we anticipate those will be awarded uh, sometime in January. And so, then we jump into our pre-acquisition planning. And so this part, there's a lot of actually internal um, processes I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Um, your agencies are developing guidance, you're, re you're evaluating and seeing what your current needs are. We also offer some live training. And so this is one of the trainings. We also had a live CAM training, um, both the PowerPoint and a pre-recorded link. Um, those are both available to you. You can access them on drive-through either in um, the customer acquisition module, or you can find them on our training page. And so it's really important that, um, you know, you really do review that agency guidance, see what is approved, what is not. And then you can also ask your fleet service representative for the GSA acquisition guide. And this is really going to be your guide to ensure you know what's available, how to place your orders, how to use CAM, anything you might have questions on regarding the acquisition process. Um, then we also have our AFE guide. So if you're looking to get um, an alternative fuel vehicle configuration, this could be something in E85, um, hybrid, electric, CNG. This is really a great guide for you. You'll be able to see our lease rates, our incremental costs, as well as the AFE mandates that you're required to follow. 
And so during this phase, you know, you're in CAM, your fleet service rep, they're going to be sending you your eligible tags. Um, really encourage you to think through um, what's the smallest vehicle to meet your mission requirements? How can you limit options? If you do need options though, there is a place um, in CAM where you can enter that. And then from there, you're gonna be selecting those standard item numbers. If you have questions on standard item numbers, you're not sure exactly what you need, um, don't worry. Um, you can always check out the federal vehicle standards to learn more. I know they're not always the most intuitive. And then we have fuel types in there as well. And so that'll ensure that you're able to get the right vehicles you need. And so I really encourage you to work with your fleet service rep. Um, they're very experienced, they know what to do, and they're, you know, they know your area really well. So if you're not really sure if there's the, you know, the proper fuel type, um, reach out to them. Uh, you guys definitely, you know, have those tools as well to be able to look around and see, but the F your FSR is a great resource. Really try to match your standard item number with your mission. So, you know, get a pickup truck where you need it, get a van where you need it, um, and, you know, really try to work with that and verify the fueling where available. From there, once everything has been approved by your headquarter fleet manager, it's made its way up through CAM, your FSR will create your order and will send it to the manufacturer to be produced and uh, to be shipped to you. And finally, the orders are delivered and you'll be contacted when you are to pick up your vehicle. So that's the general timeline. Like I said, it does usually start in the fall, but we do offer year round ordering. So if it's you know September and you have a need, um, we're always evaluating those needs. Whether they be a replacement vehicle, whether they be an additional need, um, we're happy to help you there. And remember that for any surge or seasonal requirements, we also have our short-term rental program. Here's some upcoming important dates. So we've already hit a few of these actually. Um, Auto Choice open for ordering and then CAM opened as well. November 23rd, so just last Monday, um, the FSRs have, have had to have sent all of the eligible tags to you guys. And so we did hit um, almost 100% or about 100%. So um, if you have questions about why a certain vehicle wasn't selected, you know, feel free to ask your fleet service rep, um, but you know, you should have received those at this point. So now it's um, the local point of contact. You have until December 21st, so a few weeks from now, so you still have time to take those selections and get them to your mid-level reviewer. Keep in mind, if you're an agency or a certain bureau where you don't have a mid-level, you don't have a headquarters, um, that's okay. So you'll just skip over those if that's the case for your agency. And so really just, you know, keep, keep them moving. No need to wait for a deadline to happen. Um, but these are really just our targets. And, you know, why do we care about these targets? Honestly, it's really because we are, um, you know, the manufacturers, they can decide to close out models for a number of different reasons, um, whether it be they have to shut down a plant or they run out of um, inventory. And so really, you know, for the most part, we do across all of our models and all of our SINs, we have a lot of availability, but we just want to make sure that we, we hit all those deadlines. And so we want to make sure we don't miss any models because they close out. And so doing so, it also allows GSA fleet to finish the bulk of refreshing the fleet as expeditiously as possible. Um, and then it also ensures that you receive your replacement vehicles earlier. I don't know about you, but I, if I'm expecting a package, I'm expecting a delivery, I like to get it um, as soon as I start thinking about it. So the quicker you guys can get all of your replacements in, the better. Here's just a quick refresher on the CAM approval process. As I mentioned, um, there really was a great training um, put on by Amber Robles and great training for you to watch if you have any questions about the CAM process, but this is just kind of a brief overview. So the fleet service rep, um, as you saw, it was due what, in November 23rd, so last Monday. Um, the FSR sent their replacement eligible tags to through drive-thru um, or emailed you, I should say, um, for you to review in drive-thru. So now we're at the point where um, the local customer, local driver, um, point of contact. Um, you guys are selecting your replacement standard item number in GSA fleet drive through that customer acquisition module. Remember that throughout the year, if you have additional requests, you can do so in the additionals module within GSA fleet drive through Then you're, you're sending your selection to the FSR for review. After review, the FSR can return it back 
um, or forward directly to the mid-level. And really this is just helpful because sometimes there might be something that you just forgot to put in or they have some clarifying questions. They knew that you were interested in law enforcement and you didn't specify. Um, so really this is a great opportunity for you guys to kind of engage in some discussion there. And then the agency mid-level reviewer, um, they review, they send it either to headquarters, back to you if they have questions. They can approve it or deny it, as I mentioned, and they can also enter comments, as can you. And then finally, um, if approved, the FSR creates the vehicle requisition and it's transmitted to the manufacturer. So this is what your screen will look like if you're in drive-through and looking in CAM. So you can upload documents. You'll be able to see the old standard item number, the old fuel type and, pat and description. And then this is where you would select what type of vehicle. Um, keep in mind that um, per the Energy Independence and Security Act, all light duty vehicles must be ordered as low greenhouse gas emitting. And so you can select them in the new replacement type. And so if you know that you definitely need one of these, um, which for the most part you really should be looking to do, um, unless you have a functional need for a different vehicle. So you will select the low GHD type and the SIN, and then this option bar, this is where I was mentioning you could put in law enforcement requirements, color requirements, anything else um, that you know that you need. The fuel type, you have the opportunity to enter towing weight, garage zip. And then on the right, you'll see that it lets you know whether or not it complies with that Energy Independence and Security Act, complies with agency guidance, and then if it's been rejected. And so um, this will update, so you'll be able to view this information and then you'll send it forward. So now we'll jump into our FY21 offerings. Okay, so here's some of our highlights. So just wanna keep in mind that um, in FY20, um, due to the great work of our contracting officers, our negotiations, our light duty vehicles, they achieved a 24.4% discount below invoice on average. And so that amounts to a significant amount of savings. And so that's a really great thing we're able to do. Um, and you as well, by getting these vehicles, you're able to you know, save money for the taxpayer, for the government. So thank you for that. And so this average was slightly higher than our FY19 average as well. And we do anticipate that even with um, you know, this crazy year we've all had that um, we will still achieve very similar discount below invoice this year, just based on what our awards have come in as and uh, what we anticipate purchasing this year. And so, um, you know, really great work there. And so other things I wanna mention is there's more brand diversity and new models. And this is great, as I mentioned earlier, if there are closeouts um, for whatever reason, you know, there's been a lot of um, unexpected events that have happened this year, um, we're able to have coverage across the standard item numbers. And some of these we have, you know, five or six models within one SIN and that's really great there. You'll also see new models, and a lot of these are actually in our foreign badged vehicles. Um, we are allowed to buy foreign badged in case you had questions on that. As long as we have a free trade, um, as long as there's a trade agreement with the country, um, we're able to do that. And I also want to mention that um, because of because we have all of these different brands, um, you know, it really does help a lot of different missions where you might need to um, blend in. You might need to have a different mix of vehicles for whatever that might you know, whatever your mission may require. And so um, we also just wanna keep in mind that the Transit Connect, it was very, it's always been a popular model, but um, it's a vehicle that it does have some, some size restrictions when compared to some of our other minivans. And so we actually did move it to a different standard item number this year, move from the SIN 20 to the 20B. Keep that in mind, although it is um, a vehicle that's available in E85, which is always a great option there. And then keep in mind, if you're ordering this year, um, the subcompacts in 8C or the crossover 4x2 or 4x4, 9899, or our 4x2 intermediate 100A, keep in mind that the low bid model is actually not the low greenhouse gas vehicle. And we will go over this in a few slides so you can always refer back if you have questions. E85 availability, we get a lot of questions on this. Um, we do offer a good deal of E85 vehicles. Um, but where you're not going to see them is in the sedans. We have an extensive list of hybrids this year, um, but we don't have E85, which we didn't have last year for sedans. 
Um, but we do have some E85 availability in our SUVs, um, including the Ford Explorer um, and all of our pickup trucks across the board. So it's a really great opportunity there um, to be able to meet these AFE requirements and to use the fuel. Um, I will continue to say this throughout the presentation, but um, really, unless you're using E85 fuel a significant amount of time, um, which I think is about 30% of the time or more, um, you really should look towards um, a different fuel type because you know you want to you want to try to um, get the vehicle that makes the most sense for your location and what you will use it for. We also have a good deal of vocational trucks with E85. Keep in mind some of these do have higher incrementals, and so. In order to be the best stewards of taxpayer dollar, we do, if we're not using the fuel, like I said, we want to make sure that we're not getting these vehicles. There are some, though, that are the lowest priced model. And so in those situations, if you will use it, um, you know, I encourage you to, to really get the E85 there. We have um, this year our shuttle buses. We changed the standard. And so now they're coming as gasoline as the standard engine, but there is a lot of availability in different AFE types, including electric, hybrid, CNG, and propane. Um, really great opportunity here to try out some of these alternative fuels if you're interested. And potential really for lifetime savings if you're using these vehicles. Um, there's a few early closeouts, um, but we have been told by GM, um, it's for the Silverado, the Express Van, and the Chevy Bolt, but we have been told that they will reopen. So. No need to worry there, but if you know you're ordering pickup trucks, um, subcompact EVs, um, just, you know, if you can try to, and, and utility vans, really encourage you to, to get these orders and these requests in as soon as you can. Um, because for GSA, you know, the price could increase. And so um, we want to, you know, be able to minimize the price that we're all paying and um, want to save that taxpayer dollar. So here are the new models I was talking about. We have the Nissan Sentra. Um, we have the Subaru Impreza. We've never offered Subaru before, so really excited about that one. We have the Toyota. Um, so across the board, you guys can see there's a lot of different options. Not all of them are low greenhouse gas emitting. The ones that are are the Subaru Impreza, the Mazda CX-30, which is the SIN 98A, 99A. This usually competes um, with the Compass, with the um, yeah, with the Compass, I would say, probably with the Kona as well. And so um, just keep in mind, a lot of these are not low bid, um, but they're great options if you need them to be. The Chevy Blazer is low bid. We're also able to offer you the Ford Bronco this year and the Blazer, both new, um, the Subaru um, Ascent. And then pickup trucks, these are not low bid, but we have um, the Nissan Titan, the Jeep Gladiator, and then um, we have the Nissan NV series. So just some new offerings we have. It ensures that we have um, you know, complete coverage if anything were to happen, and it just gives you more of a choice here. So what are we looking at with sedans and station wagons? So this year, our SIN 7 Hyundai um, Accent came in very low. Um, it's also low greenhouse gas. Really encourage you to consider this one. Um, it's a little bit less hip room than the 8C um, Nissan Sentra and Elantra, but um, great option. Um, this year it came in under about $2,000 less expensive. Um, so if you're interested in this one, um, encourage you to look to a SIN 7 this year. Um, but I will say that in the SIN 8C, although the Hyundai Elantra is not low bid, it's been completely redesigned. And so, and it is low greenhouse gas emitting where the Sentra is not. And so this is a great option. It's only $5 more per month. Our choice for hybrids this year, we do have um, availability in both the 8H and the 9H, so the subcompact and compact, um, but really encourage you to look at the 8H. It has a 58, it's 58 miles per gallon, so incredibly efficient there, um, and a very low incremental of only $2,666. For the compact, we have the 9C Chevy Malibu, then you'll see some um, familiar, uh, you know, we have the 10V Dodge Charger, we've had that in the past. And this year we have the 12A Hyundai Venue to compete with the Nissan Kicks. Last year the Kicks was low greenhouse gas, this year it's not, um, but a good option if you want something slightly bigger. What I will say though is if you're looking for that station wagon size vehicle and you want low greenhouse gas, you might be better off with a SIN 98A or 99A. 
So the 20, um, the SIN 20 versus 20B, we did, like I said, we did make that move to put them into two different standard item numbers. Um, so the Voyager, some benefits is that it does have that stow and go feature. That's great if you're storing anything, if you need that extra space. Keep in mind though, that it does add $52 to the monthly rate. Um, so if you need it, you know, definitely encourage you to get it. But um, if you don't, then you might, you might, you know, be happier either without it or really to look to that 20B Transit Connect. Um, the, the SIN 20 Voyager, it's also not low greenhouse gas emitting. And so if you click on that low greenhouse gas passenger van, and this is actually a drop through from CAM. So if you click on that, you will see the 20B Transit Connect, but you won't see the Voyager. So the 20B Transit Connect, smaller dimensions, lower GVWR, lower payload, and a smaller engine, um, but it, it does seat five to six passengers comfortably. Um, E85 is available, and like I said, it's low greenhouse gas. So really the conclusion to draw here is that the Transit Connect, it's a better choice if you're using E85, if you require low greenhouse gas or filling with you know, three to four passengers, it might be a little snug if you're going more than that. So just something to keep in mind when you're in CAM. Here's our SIN 30 cargo minivans. We have the Nissan NV200, um, which as I mentioned is one of those new models. It's low greenhouse gas. Um, the only drawback is that you don't get E85. So if you need E85, you might be better off with the Transit Connect and cargo. But as I mentioned, don't select it if you won't use the fuel. Jumping into our SUVs. So I've highlighted here in green the ones that are low greenhouse gas emitting. Um, but some of them, as I said before, some of them do have um, slightly, they have a fee, a slight fee attached because the low greenhouse gas vehicle is not low bid. So you'll see that on the screen. So for example, in the SIN 98, although the Hyundai Tucson, although it is low bid, it is not low greenhouse gas. The Chevy Equinox in both the 4x2 and 4x4 is, um, but in the 4x2, it adds $8 per month, and in the 4x4, it adds $16 per month. So really, it's important to keep that in mind um, when you're thinking about your budget. Um, but remember that um, it is required that you purchase low greenhouse gas. So you, know, you need to kind of weigh and see what's more most important to you. And one option might just be that you wanna move into hybrid. Um, and so what I encourage too, is if you're in an area where um, you have you know, E85, but there's no E85 vehicles that meet your need, you might be better off getting looking to that hybrid in those situations. Um, this year too, we also have those GMC terrains in the four by two and four by four, both, um, both of those are low greenhouse gas. Um, and keep in mind the SIN 96, it's a really great alternative if, you've, if you're replacing um, a SIN 105A, so an intermediate type vehicle, you know, a vehicle that's the same size as like a Grand Cherokee or an Explorer. Um, you do save some money on that and you also, it's also low greenhouse gas um, and it's more efficient overall. And really overall, I mean, the, the SIN 98A and 99A, they will offer you the most efficiency and price savings, um, but they are a little bit smaller. And so you just need to weigh um, what's important to you, how will you meet your mission. Now jumping into the pickups. Um, as we all know, a lot of times it's certain options that you are getting that really drive you into which vehicle that you'll end up selecting. Um, but we do have some great options for you. In most of them, the Chevy Silverados are low bid. Um, but in the SIN 55, we have the Ram 1500. Um, in all of our Ford and GMs, E85 is available across the board. And so we're excited to offer you that. We have the Colorado, we have the Ranger um, and the Gladiator as well for that the subcompact pickup. And you'll see all the way on the right, um, something I'm very excited about in spring of 2021. So a little bit later into this fiscal year, um, Ford is able to offer us some hybrid pickup trucks and their crew cabs and their 4x2 and 4x4. So these will be available in CAM currently, so you probably see them in the drop down, um, but they do have late av availability. Um, there is a very, very slight chance that something could happen. Ford could end up not offering them or opening them up, but um, I wouldn't fret and select them if you do want them. Keep in mind they do carry with them some incremental about 
um, 14 to 16,000, depending on if you're getting the four by two or four by four. So just make sure that your agency overall is budgeting for that. Um, but as you guys know, you, you are paying the, that monthly surcharge to help you accumulate money to pay for these vehicles. Um, the four by two could be low greenhouse gas. We haven't gotten those numbers yet, um, but the four by four actually we do know that it has, it's a 24, it's 24 miles per gallon is the fuel economy. So um, pretty impressive there, but you just have to make sure that you're driving the vehicle enough that the costs really justify you getting that vehicle. But regardless, I'm very excited that we are offering it. It's really the first time in, I think, yeah, definitely a few years since we've had um, hybrid availability and pickup. So excited there. So some, some items that we offer, um, they might require just some additional justification. Um, and the reason being is that for some of these items, um, we find that there's very comparably sized vehicles with the same functionality that you can get for a good deal um, less, you know, a good deal less. And so um, it's some of the four by four SUVs. And most of these are ones that are subcompact, hard top or off road. These are SINs 5A, 99B, and 112. Um, and then off-road trucks and compact pickups. So some of the, the ones that end in R. Um, and then our, our subcompacts, so any of the Series 60 pickup trucks. And if you look to the right, you'll notice that for the SIN 55 Ram, this is our low-bid model, um, it's almost, what, $5,000 difference to get the Colorado. And so um, they really do have similar functionality. So we really rec recommend here that you go with the RAM when you can. Um, but if you have a different justification of why you need it, um, just let us know and you know, make sure to include a document in CAM. And then speak with your FSR as well if you have questions. So I know I was talking a lot about incrementals, um, low greenhouse gas emitting vehicles. Um, well, the reason, you know, these are important because they offer us efficiencies and cost savings, but there's also requirements um, to get them. And so I um, just want to go over these a little bit so that everyone is on the same page about, you know, what's driving some of this um, other than, you know, just really great new technology and more efficiencies overall, both in the market and, you know, the needs of all of our agencies. So just for a big picture perspective, here are some of the fleet requirements that relate to acquisition specifically um, and alt fuel use. So all of these drive our purchasing decisions and our, you know, the vehicles that we are requesting. So the first one is the federal executive order that came under this, um, this current administration, executive order 13834. And so the goal is to optimize efficiency and performance, eliminate waste and protect the environment. And it tells us to do so by meeting the statutory requirements, which include reducing petroleum. Um, every agency is actually measured on that one on your scorecard from OMB, and then increase alternative fuel. Um, and then follow all of the other statutory requirements below, um, you know, in an efficient manner um, that protects the environment. And so we always want to remember that one is kind of the framework for the others and um, so the next one is reducing petroleum consumption, as I mentioned. Um, and then the, these three that, that relate to acquisition, um, you know, particularly are acquire low greenhouse gas emitting vehicles. Um, and these are any vehicle under 8,500 pounds. So they include all sedans, all SUVs, and then our pickup trucks that are under 8,500 pounds, which is really any um, F-150, um, Silverado, or Ram 1500 size vehicle or smaller. The compacts are included as well. And then this also includes any medium duty vehicle that sits nine passengers um, behind the steering wheel. Um, so just keep that in mind that you have to get low greenhouse gas. Um, the exceptions to this that you can take is if you have a functional need for a non low greenhouse gas vehicle, or if you've taken an alternative measure to reduce petroleum. So that would be if you for example, traded in three smaller cars for a larger car. Then optimize fleet inventory, right size. So if you can um, turn in vehicles you aren't using, um, you know, just think of different ways to right size. Maybe you had a SIN 105 and then you decide to replace it with a crossover SUV. Um, there definitely are a lot of options in crossover SUVs. In the commercial marketplace, they've grown about 40%. They're the fastest growing car segment. So there's really a lot of 
a lot of great offerings that you probably have seen. So these are any of our, um, our 90 series SUVs. The next one, acquiring alternative fuel vehicles. So purchasing 75% of your light duty vehicles as AFEs. Keep in mind with this one, it's light duty. So if you go above and beyond and you're acquiring some of your medium and heavy duty vehicles as AFEs, they're essentially extra credit. They count in the numerator of the equation. Um, and then this is also just in MSAs as measured by the 1980 census. Doesn't make much sense, I know, but that's the law. So um, you guys do a great job meeting this. I know sometimes there can be questions about how to meet it or um, you know, if there's ways you can improve on meeting it. If you have questions, please reach out to um, my team. We're happy to help you try and you know, get a, a more holistic look of your fleet and see what you can do. Um, also keep in mind that low greenhouse gas emitting vehicles that are gasoline or diesel, those count um, when alternative fuel is not within three miles. And then the bottom one, use alternative fuel in AFEs. This is uh, measured by the EPAC section 701. And you guys used to have to file waivers for these. Luckily, DOE has changed the process. And so now if you're in, if you're in Fleet Dash or you use Fleet Dash, um, it, this is automatically calculated for you. So the minimum size necessary, this is in the FMR, the Federal Management Regulation. It says, you may only obtain the minimum size of motor vehicle necessary to fulfill your agency's mission in accordance with the following considerations. So really getting vehicles that are fuel efficient and you're limiting that body size, engine size, and optional equipment. Um, so this is just, you know, making sure that, you know, if you need to carry this lumber as in this picture with this pickup truck, um, you're getting the right vehicle. Um, if you don't need to carry it and you can do without a pickup truck, then, you know, get a smaller vehicle. I think you guys do a really great job of this overall. Prioritizing federal requirements. So we went over them. There's a lot of them. Sometimes some of them seem to conflict um, or you're not exactly sure. And so what I would say is follow this um, chart from left to right if you can. Really select the smallest, most efficient vehicle. While you're doing this, it's likely that that vehicle is low greenhouse gas. So look to acquire low greenhouse gas where you can. The drop down in CAM can be really helpful for vehicle type. Um, it's actually um, each the low greenhouse gas uh, Vehicle types are actually in green, which I think is pretty helpful for me at least. And then when you're selecting fuel type, really match your acquisitions to the fueling locations. And then finally, select AFEs where you can. And this is helping you meet that 75%. And so it really, it's a tough job because you guys are really balancing your agency mission as well um, while still keeping those federal requirements in mind. So really appreciate what you, what you guys do. And, reach out to your FSRs if you have questions on this one. <clears throat> so just to put it all on one slide, um, we've been talking throughout the previous slides about which vehicles are low greenhouse gas emitting, they help you meet ESA. And here they are all listed for you. Um, there is a note at the bottom um, that the low greenhouse models in certain SINs are low greenhouse gas, but not low bid. So keep these in mind, but you really do have a lot of options here. And so the only big class of vehicles that aren't really represented here are those um, small, those pickup trucks that are less than 8,500 pounds. And for those, I would say, um, you know, order E85 when you're gonna use the fuel. And if not, you know, you have a functional need for your pickup trucks. The federal fleet is a working fleet. Over 40% of the vehicles in the federal fleet are pickups. And so EPA understands, we understand um, what your missions are and your needs. So it's okay if you can't order low greenhouse gas in those situations, you have a functional need to, uh, to not, but there is a lot of great options across SUVs, vans, and sedans. So you should be able to meet it, um, I would think, you know, at least 90% of the time um, by you know, just selecting one of these options. And here's a slide that just has all of our hybrid offerings, our plug-in hybrids, our electrics, and so when looking at these vehicles, um, some of my picks, so looking at um, the hybrids on the left, um, the 8H Ionic I mentioned has 58 miles per gallon. This is a great choice when looking at all of the sedans. Um, and the reason being for that is that 
the incremental cost is really low and the MPG is high. So it's very, very efficient, um, a great vehicle there. Um, you'll see a lot of availability across our 98. So if you have situations where there's E85 and you really would like to use E85, um, but you don't have a crossover to pick this year, I think that's a great opportunity um, to get a hybrid if you need it. Um, but keep in mind that these vehicles, they have incrementals and the, the best reason to get it is that you drive these vehicles a lot. If they're getting, you know, 12,000 miles a year plus, um, it's really, it's a great opportunity to get a hybrid. I would even say, you know, 15,000, but wherever you can, um, or if it helps you meet some of your agency goals, um, these hybrids can be great options. On the right, we have our plug-in hybrid electrics. You'll see that we have the 8P Ionic. This is a great choice, but unfortunately this year it's only available um, by Hyundai in California. So if you're not in California, you might wanna to look to a different option. We have our, our Pacifica again. It's likely the MPG will be very similar to last year. It just hasn't been published yet by fueleconomy.gov, which is the site that EPA manages. Um, but we have great options in terms of, we have four, both four by two and four by four offerings. Um, the Outlanders all wheel drive and then all electrics, we have the Bolt and the Leaf this year. Both um, have the option for DC fast charging. On the Leaf, it is standard. Um, the range on that Bolt is just very impressive. With 259, you know, you'll really be able to accomplish most missions there. Um, and public charging is an option if you're interested in that. And so we'll have a slide to cover that, but we're happy to help you. And then we also have some electric availability um, in our shuttle buses. and. Um, although we don't have specific MPG data, um, our research has shown it's about a 40% improvement um, and the range is 105 miles all electric. If you're in California and you would like a bit of a challenge, you're excited to try some new technology, um, and I should actually take that back, not a bit of a challenge, but you want something new, um, we are offering a fuel cell vehicle, the 98F, the Nexo. <clears throat> and so the benefit with um, with hydrogen is that it's, it takes under five minutes to fuel. Um, what's not so great is there's only about 50 stations, but most of them are, um, almost all of them, I should say, are in California, either in Southern California near San Diego and LA or Northern California near San Francisco, um, but great option there. And you do get a range of 380 miles. So that is one of the benefits of hydrogen. Um, the stations themselves cost a very a significant amount to put in, which is why we don't see as many stations. We don't see hydrogen scaling um, as much as you know we would all like it to. But we're offering this vehicle, it's four by two. Um, the Nexo, the dimensions, it's slightly bigger than a Tucson, um, but it's you know so it's a pretty good size, good size SUV. The incremental though um, is a little steep at thirty eight thousand because the base cost of the vehicle is pretty high. Um, but if you want to try this one out, it's, um, it's, it's a good vehicle. <coughs> Excuse me. So how do you fund AFEs? And you do this through the surcharge. Um, it's a monthly per vehicle per month surcharge. You can see the picture on the bottom. It'll appear as sales code X3. And so why do we fund AFEs this way, right? It seems, um, it seems like a whole process. And re re really the reason we do it is that um, EPACT, it requires that GSA spreads the incremental cost of AFEs across the fleet. And really, the purpose of this um, is to make alternative fuel vehicles as accessible and as affordable um, to the most number of agencies as possible. And it really does that because you're paying a very set amount for most agencies. It's between $2 and $20, just depending on your agency and what your goals are. Um, it is set by the headquarters fleet manager at the beginning of the year based on a recommendation. Um, we look at previous spend. We also look at our new awards to make that recommendation. Um, and we can we change it or we turn it off. And so it essentially covers um, your purchases of AFEs or your request for AFEs in that given fiscal year. So AFE infrastructure, as I mentioned, it's so important to understand and know which stations are in your area because that'll really help you figure out which vehicles are best for you. And so we do have some bio B20 capable. These are vehicles that can operate on biodiesel, 20% um, biodiesel fuel. Um, biodiesel, it's, it increases your fuel efficiency by 15% or more. Um, it's completely renewable. 
And so it's a great option there. Keep in mind the sprinters are our only vehicles this year that are not B20 capable. So they cannot operate on this fuel. They have to operate on B5 or less. Um, E85 availability, as I mentioned, we have the 105A and 100L Explorer. And then all of our cargo and passenger vans for the most part have E85 availability and those Ford and GM trucks. Um, but the incrementals can be, can be high. So your fleet service rep and your agency headquarter fleet manager, they do have a list of which of your vehicles have been using the fuel, as I'm sure you guys know which vehicles use the fuel, which don't. And so really keep that in mind. And a little fun fact, um, there are more electric vehicle charging stations than any other alternative fuel. Um, there's over 80,000 actually ports and then a little under 30,000 stations. So really good deal. Um, they continue to build out the infrastructure. You can use the AFDC station locator to help you locate fuel. And then you can view our um, alternative fuel guide to learn more about our offerings. Charging, so if you would like to um, charge at a station, um, we can actually get you a WEX, uh, sorry, a charge point card that we've already connected to your WEX fleet service card. So WEX and Voyager, both two credit cards that are used by the federal fleet, they're both accepted at ChargePoint. And so we can do this for you. Um, and this will allow you to view your fuel use data and the fuel in the fuel use report and drive through. Um, and so a lot of these other networks, we are working with them. We hope that they accept WEX and Voyager soon, um, but they don't at this point. And this really helps you charge publicly. But if you would like to just buy a station on your own, we also have a contract set up that's already been, um, it's already been pre-negotiated. And so you can simply um, go and view our available items. We have five manufactured products across level one, level two, and DC fast charging. Um, the prices are very competitive. They're 30% below market prices on average. And so if you are selecting the lowest price station within a given item, a given CLIN, um, is what we call it. It's essentially what a SIN is for vehicles. Um, then you can actually just go directly to the vendor and purchase the vehicle. In most cases, it'll come within 30 days. And so it's a really great way to get your own charging station. Um, and then also just keep in mind the FAST Act allows agencies to install stations for workplace charging. Specialty vehicles. So law enforcement vehicles. So there's some big changes for this year. We have 12 upfit packages. Um, it's down from about 30 last year, and that's not a bad thing at all. Um, what we did add was a la carte options, which really gives you some more flexibility. And so if, you are, if you're interested in finding out more about the law enforcement options, one thing you could do, you can go to the vehicle, uh, the vehicle standards, um, select 2021, and then click go. Click the gray documentation tab near the top. And then under the document category, you would click on law enforcement vehicles. And so right now, if, you, um, if you're looking to select a vehicle in CAM, everything is loaded. And so you can select the law enforcement vehicle you would like and then put some of the options in the comments. But if you are interested in the particular vehicle models themselves, you can view them on auto choice, they'll all be there. Um, but as I mentioned, for the particular options, right now you need to view those um, using, uh, using the federal standards. <clears throat> and when you're on the federal standards, you'll be able to view a list of files for all LU options and special options. So it's a great way to see that. And so soon we have a brochure and guide. Um, we anticipate we'll have that very soon for you. We also have marked, unmarked, and K9. So really a lot of great options. FY21 buses. So we were able to achieve um, over a million dollars of savings this year in negotiations. So you're gonna see some very great and competitive prices we have 11 vendors, um, two of them are new, and there's a lot of alternative fuel options. Um, these especially work, as I mentioned, when you drive these vehicles, you put a lot of miles on them. We also have some electric shuttle bus options and um, XL fleet hybrid. You guys might've seen them at different conventions or seen ads for them, but we do offer some XL fleet hybrid options. Um, most of the incrementals range from 18 to 24,000, but they do boast a 25% MPG increase and a 20% reduction in CO2. So great to check out there. You can actually select these vehicles in CAM. Medium and heavies, as I mentioned, new awards are coming in January, but 
We do anticipate that there's gonna be um, some great tech advancements like new safety features, um, some maximum fuel economy packages for tractors, and then some battery powered auxiliary units. Um, there's also all-in-one power auxiliary units for maintenance trucks and shore and solar battery charging options. So the SINs are in CAM, select them when you can. If you have questions about the particular vehicles themselves, we're happy to speak with you more on them. Uh, telematics in FY21. So telematics, they will be deployed on all on new GSA fleet vehicles moving forward. Um, we hope we will have fleet-wide implementation over the coming years. This is where appropriate. Um, so some of the immediate benefits, so you guys will not have questions anymore about mileage being entered incorrectly or any kind of mileage issues. We will get all of that automated. Um, and then we also have expanded service options for you guys at very discounted prices. There's a lot of different options there. We're happy to speak more about them. There's automated ordering as well. And then this will be performed really at any CNS marshalling location. So um, once you guys pick up the vehicles, they'll be ready to go. And then as I mentioned, if desired, you guys can opt in for expanded services um, through a new drive-through telematics module, which will be in drive-through. It's not there yet. We anticipate it'll be a little bit later in FY21. We have a fact sheet, um, but if you have um, any specific questions, feel free to email fleets, our fleet solutions team at uh, fleet solutions at gsa.gov. So just some tips, tips and tricks um, with CAM and with our offerings just to, you know, close us up um, for today, but really familiar yourself with drive through That'll really save you. If you are not registered, you might need to have your customer number and access code handy, or you actually certainly will need to. Um, and so if you don't have that, your FSR can provide it, or you can email the drive through help desk. Um, review the CAM fleet live link. It's very helpful. And then read our 2021 acquisition guide. Right now your FSRs have that, so they're happy to share it with you. And work closely with your FSR. Utilize a lot of our helpful features. We have a bulk comment feature. We have an approval feature. Um, you can use the document upload. Um, you know, a lot of agencies are really using CAM as just a way to communicate and approve different things in their, in their internal processes. So it's a good way to do that. And then really be as specific as possible. If you know you need something, really let us know um, because that'll ensure that you get the right vehicle. And that's really what everyone's goal is here. And ask questions, report um, any kind of system related issues as soon as you see them. Select the right SIN and fuel type. So review your guidance, ensure the selection meets the guidance and then check those the federal standards when you can. And select low greenhouse gas in CAM. That'll ensure you're meeting the energy independence and security requirement to get low greenhouse gas vehicles. And some big takeaways, refer to FSRs for help throughout the process. Communicate using CAM and features. Keep the process moving. Review your agency's guidance and then also any kind of guidance on our vehicles themselves. Choose the smallest, most efficient vehicle for the mission and follow the AFE guide, match engine to available infrastructure. And here's some resources. Um, there are links here um, from anything from the federal standards to the FY21 AFE guide, the minimum replacement criteria, if you have a question about why a vehicle wasn't selected to be replaced. And then some information on EV charging stations and infrastructure, how to find alternative fuel. And then a link to find your FSR if you're not sure who he or she is. It's just www.gsa.gov backslash FSR. And the CAM instructions will be, uh, or they are in CAM. Here's some um, email addresses. So if you have questions on you know, specific items, you can reach out there. Um, but I will take this time now and open it up to some questions. We got a question, there's a lot of information. Is there a down and dirty condensed version or a cheat, uh, cheat sheet? Um, what I would say is that, yes, this is a lot of information. Um, if there's a particular area you're more interested in than others, you know, for example, if you're very interested in EVs, we have some EV fact sheets. If you wanna know a little bit more about 
um, towing. We actually have some towing um, information as well. So we're happy to get you that. Just reach out. And if it's, if it's a resource that we think everybody would benefit for, from, um, we will share that out with our fleet service reps and they will get it to you. Any other questions? Steph, there are a few more that have come in. Um, I can read them to you if you want. Okay, let me see. I think I might've went to the top. I can, um, let's see, I can read some of these. Someone said that 105A is a Chevy Blazer. Is it Ford or Chevy? That one's Chevy. Okay, I see some open ones. Is there a minimum mileage requirement concerning time to change vehicles or do the reps keep track and notify us? So there, there actually are, there's minimum replacement criteria and it differs from each type. So it might be 60,000 miles and five years. And so it really just depends on the specific vehicle type. And if you go to our website, um, our external website, you can find it there, but it is different for different vehicles. And that's how we decide which vehicles we wanna replace in a given year. Someone asked, we, required a vehicle, we acquired a vehicle 15 months ago, but it does not meet our requirements. How do we go about replacing it? Um, just speak with your FSR on that one. And so we really don't keep um, vehicles in our inventory we're not using, but it's very possible that another customer could really use that vehicle. Where do we locate the lease payment options and is it per month? So we do have a, uh, a rate bulletin. You'll see there's two, one is for CONUS, so Continental US and one's for OCONUS outside. And that's on our website as well. You guys could take a look at that. Where would I find more information on the SIN description? Um, I would really recommend the federal vehicle standards. And so you can see those vehicles there. Um, if you wanna go a step, well, I would actually in the vehicle standards, you'll also see, so say you choose a SIN 105A, You'll see the entire description, what, are, what the minimum requirements are for seating, engine, tires, all that information. Um, but you'll also see some of the vehicles that were, um, that were bid. So you'll see the Explorer, the Blazer, the Grand Cherokee. And so you can actually just use specific information on those vehicles as well. Someone might be having an issue getting in touch with an FSR. Um, there is on our website, gsa.gov backslash um, FSR. You would also find the number to the fleet, the specific um, FMC, Fleet Management Center. And so they're happy to help you there. Um, I apologize if um, there's an issue with um, any of the GSA employees, but we do want to help you. Someone asked if we have any information if GSA plans to get the all wheel drive passenger van back. Um, I don't know, Dan Buckingham, I think he's on the call. Do you have um, an answer on that one or thoughts yeah, on that? I just, I just typed a, uh, a note in that one, but yeah, there's there's options for all wheel drive or four by four available on the full size vans. You can see those in auto choice if you go in there and review. Thanks, Dan. Someone said, I found myself switching hybrid vehicles out for gas vehicles because they're not used as much as they should be utilized. Is this a good move to make? Hybrids cost too much to service. So, you know, hybrid vehicles, you do need to drive them consistently. Um, you don't want the battery to sit. Um, and I know we had some of, some of this happen or there were concerns about this, especially during COVID um, times when people were working remotely a little bit more often, um, but you should try to drive the vehicles as much as you can. And so, um, if, you're, if you have a particular vehicle that's having issues, you know, please let your fleet service rep know. There could be just an issue with that particular vehicle, um, but yeah, let us know. How do we order a lift gate? Do you have an option to add a fuel tank into a pickup bed? Is there an option for extra security on the utility box? Dan, do you wanna take this one? Sure. So. 
Um, lift gates are available on certain vehicles. They're not going to be available on pickup trucks. That's something you would have to add because because the manufacturers won't offer those options direct from the from the um, plant. So that's something you would have to af add aftermarket through the vehicle modification request. You would talk to your FSR about that. Um, if you're looking at uh, vocational vehicles or some of the medium and heavy trucks, then yeah, we do have options for lift gates available. There, there are options that you can select that would come right on the truck um, new. Um, again, an option to add a fuel tank to a pickup bed, that would be a modification you'd have to do after you receive the vehicle. Um, extra security on a utility box. Um, that Again, that's something that you would do through a modification request with your FSR once you get the vehicle. Uh, we don't have options for those for pickups. Thanks, Dan. Then we had questions about um, someone can't find box trucks. And I've pulled down a lot of drop downs to find them. And I need a lift gate too with the box truck. Yeah, they're they're gonna be listed as cargo vans, not box truck. Um, and they're and dependent on the size, they're gonna be either the, you know, the medium duty or, or heavy duty vehicles. Not sure what size you're looking for, but um, we definitely have them. If you, you know, if you need assistance, you can um, shoot us an email and we can help you there. But yes, we do have box trucks with lift gates um, available. Great, thanks, Dan. And like, yep, somebody is asking, I'm new to this process, just wondering if there's any upcoming drive through desktop workshops, previous trainings. Um, I really advise you to go on to the training page within GSA Fleet drive through I believe you actually don't even need to leave, log on to drive through for you to be able to see that. And somebody was asking, the equipment code for the 105H. Um, you can actually find that in the alternative fuel vehicle guide. Let me pull that one up. Let's see, is there any other questions? I want to thank you everyone who joined today. Um, really appreciate your attention. So for the 105H, the equipment code is 6247. Oops, if you do not see that one um, in the rate bulletin, um, let's see, we can pull up what the actual rate is on that. So yeah, the rate on the 105H, it's $260 a month and the mileage rate is 22 cents per mile. Once again, thank you everyone. And if you have any follow-up questions, uh, please let us know. We're happy to get them answered. And happy acquisition season, everyone.